Before I actually left the GMO detection laboratory, I was, I was at a workshop in St. Louis. I love to dance and I was taking Lindy Hop weekend in St. Louis, which is a type of swing dance. And um, we were on a lunch break. So I went to a Thai restaurant with a bunch of friends and some other dancers came in the door and we called them over to sit with us. I, we don't know them. And one guy sat right across from me. And I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a, yeah, I'm a molecular biologist. I work at Monsanto. <laughs> Whoa, talk about a setup. I said, oh, what do you do for Monsanto? He said, uh, I do the safety studies on the GMOs. So I wasn't an activist at the time. I was working for a neutral GMO laboratory. So I, and this was lunch and he was a fellow Lindy Hopper. So I kind of just lightly discussed allergenic constructs over the meal <laughs> and what, you know, there's no way they can block against that. And then I said to him, how do you know, like when you insert a gene, there's some mutations that that's inevitable. You can't help that. How do you know that you're not messing up parts of the genome that are important? And he said, we're learning all the time, which are important regions. I'm thinking that's a little late. We're already eating GMOs. And then I challenged him. I said, what if it's all important? What if the every piece of the se sequence uses laws of nature that we haven't discovered, maybe even quantum mechanical, maybe quantum field effects? What if it's all important and you're disrupting things you can't even measure at this point? He was looking at me and then he just looked down and continued to eat. His friend that came with him said, that was deep. <laughs> But there was a long silence. No one said anything. It was at least a minute. And he looked up and he said, but you know, we need GMOs. I said, what? He said, we need GMOs to feed the world because in 2040 or 2050, there's going to be so many people. And I knew he was sincere. And I knew he was wrong. I knew already that the feed the world concept was something that his PR firm put out to the world and that there was more food per person than any time in human history. GMOs don't actually increase yields, et cetera, et cetera. We've won that argument a long time ago, but he was sincere and he was wrong. But that was his answer. When I got to the bottom line question, what are, you know, might you be hurting people? And his answer was, we need it to feed the world. So he was willing to accept what he didn't know because he had the excuse that the benefit was too great. Which reminded me years later, which I was reminded of years later when I interviewed a, interviewed a Dr. Goodman who was working for Monsanto doing research studies. Then I went into deep, this was a phone conversation, and it was for help with the, producing the book. And we were going into the very technical details of the structure of the amino acids and the proteins produced by genetically engineered corn. And I said, but look, you can't obviously verify that you're not creating a protein that could be allergenic to at least some members of the population because you cannot validate that something is an allergen until people have eaten it multiple times, and you would need a huge sample of people eating it in order to do a study. So some people might get allergenic, might get allergic responses, and might even have anaphylactic shock, and might even die as a result. And it was, there was no way he could get out of it scientifically. So his response was, but we need GMOs. <laughs> the same point, we need GMOs. I said, why? He said, to feed the world. And it was like that. It's just because when you get to the end of the road and you win in the science, they leap to some idealistic need. And what he said was, I've been to India. I've seen their agriculture and they need our GMOs. So fast forward, they end up introducing GMOs in India and they introduce cotton. 
and they make a cotton that's genetically engineered to produce the BT toxin to kill the boll weevil. And it was a disaster. So the cotton was tested on irrigated fields, and most of the fields in India are not irrigated, it's rain fed. The yields that were reported were never achievable in real world examples. No one believed it who knew who understood the science. So they came in with potentially fraudulent research and knowing we know, we know about research that they do, I'm convinced it was fraudulent. And they had an unprecedented marketing program. They used Bollywood actors. They paid off the, the rich farmers in the area to have big festivals. They had, um, they promised all sorts of improved uh, profit. They had people standing next to tractors claiming that it was the, the, the cotton seeds. They had people who weren't even farmers, you know, with quotes. It was complete fraud. And they even had someone, you know, um, doctor results locally, adding a little one in a pen of different color to try and improve the, uh, the, the, the viewpoint of the public on these failed uh, genetically engineered cotton seeds. Well, some of the cotton seeds wouldn't germinate at all. Some produced smaller bowls, bowl, uh, cotton with lower, lower quality, cotton that required more labor, cotton that was shorter in its fiber, so it, it fetched less in the market. Sometimes the, the GMO cotton was overrun, had root rot or leaf curl. And later, if they did kill off the BT, I mean, the, the, the uh, boll weevil, they were um, swarmed with other insects requiring multiple sprays. And the push by Monsanto was so successful in getting these farmers to invest in these seeds, which were marketed as much as a thousand times more expensive than the same seeds you'd get in the United States. They had to buy the seeds and certain chemicals. They couldn't, they couldn't get loans at the bank, so they went to loan sharks called the secondary market. Some of these farmers had signed on the dotted line to pay interest of 7% per month. And then when the seeds failed throughout the cotton region, they were faced with losing their land to the loan sharks, land that had been in the family for years, huge disgrace, and many committed suicide. Based on estimates and door-to-door -door surveys and leaked documents and work done by Vanda Nasheva, we now estimate that the number of suicides among BT cotton farmers linked to the failure of their cotton is about 250,000. So this is what this doctor from Monsanto, this science scientist, he was saying we, India needed it. But there were some other pieces there that people were reporting among the workers that they were getting itching and flu-like symptoms. So in my second book, I looked at the documentation of the symptoms of people who were sprayed with the BT toxin, which is a natural toxin, it was sprayed in the Pacific Northwest to, to kill um, uh, some pests there. Um, and they had all these specific symptoms. I looked at the doctor's report in India of people handling the cotton, and sure enough, it was the same symptoms, because the cotton was genetically engineered to produce this BT toxin at thousands of times the concentration of the spray. People leaning against the bales. There was people in the cleaning, the, the gins where they were cleaning the cotton, they had to take antihistamines every day to go to work. In addition, there were reports of farmers, from farmers who, or ranchers who brought their, their animals to, to graze on the cotton plants after harvest, which they'd been doing for years, and many died. There was a place where 13 buffaloes died. I went to this village in India. 13 buffalo died the day within three days after grazing on, on the cotton. And many sheep, half their sheep and goats. It was absolutely terrible. But also I said, how many of you have noticed itching when you are working in the, in the uh, fields? All these people raised their hand. So we have a toxic um, 
protein produced in this, we have some kind of toxicity in the plant, and we have a system which results in massive suicides. Now, in most places in the world, the approval process is a sham. <clears throat> the same thing with India. Mo because a lot of governments are pro-GMO, they assign with the recommendations of the biotech industry, the scientists to be on the approval committee that will be rubber stamps. And so there was a Supreme Court petition in India claiming that it was a facade. And so the Supreme Court asked PM Bhargava, one of the most decorated and celebrated scientists in the world to investigate. He became a member of the Genetic Engineering Approval Committee. And about nine months later, he wrote his report, sent it to the, to the um, Supreme Court, sent it to the, to the Prime Minister, and sent it to the Health Minister. And he said, it is a facade, that it's a rubber stamp. He said there are maybe 30 studies, categories of studies that need to be done in order to approve the safety of GMOs and less than 10% have been done. And they've been done by industry and so poorly, they're basically worthless. So no GMO crop anywhere in the world has been properly investigated. Now, as soon as he put this out, he was attacked by members of the, of the committee that he had just been a part of, saying he has no experience in DNA research. Well, he had more studies published than on that and the entire committee put together in nature and science he was he, 25 of he told me 25 of his close personal friends and former students have nobel prizes so i went and and videotaped my talk with him for a couple of hours i was releasing my book genetic roulette in india and sat with him and he described all of the things that needed to be done to test for the safety now in genetic roulette I had come up with all these different risks, 65 different risks of GMOs, and all this critique of the, of the uh, ways that GMOs could be dangerous and how they needed to be studied. And I had gotten it from dozens of scientists. Here was this one man listing nearly every single one of them. The change in the, in the genome, the change in the protein, the combination of genes, the effects on the environment, the, the folding, misfolding of the protein, the added sugar chains, things that got very technical, and he was just laying them all out. I said, how is it that you have such a wide perspective to be able to name all of these things? He said, these days, most scientists are, have blinders on. They're just focused on their one area of research. But I've been doing this for decades and decades, and I'm focused on big wide angles like the origin of life on the planet. He, he was dealing with these huge things. He was the head of the, on the knowledge committee, which reported to the prime minister that had access to all the data and all the science, etc. He was very well respected, and he had this wide thinking. And he was saying what we had taken 30 scientists to conclude, no GMOs were properly regulated. We could not get through to the prime minister. He was very focused on promoting IT and biotech. And I've met with top ministers, government ministers in India. When I released my book in 18 different cities around India, um, very often it was a minister of ag or a minister of health that was there to, re to release the book. The states were against it, but the federal government was in lockdown. And I've seen this before because certain ministries are been captured by Monsanto. So this past week, the government of India just approved to deregulate most gene edited foods, uh, organisms, which means you can genetically engineer through gene editing anything and put it in the environment or put it in the food supply without telling anyone. So it's a disaster, but they're not the only country.